you know, he brought along with him the Maya language, which I am very proud of it. I'm very proud of being a Maya. Juan Chuk is the name of my great grandfather. He was a Maya rebel of Chan Santa Cruz. It was not just a massacre, but it was the creation of nearly the entire north of Belize, part of the west. During this war, boundaries were set. We have been fighting evil, but then okay, that I put you on. Tell me I'm going to do a tula. Tula. What do you hear? Oh, crook. Nila, son. So that we learn to love our country, love our history, love our roots, and be proud of it. I'm a proud Mayan. All right, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, we are about to get into our first segment. What a wonderful video uh, that was. And of course, it's the introduction to what we're about to uh, get into for the first segment. Firstly, we want to introduce our guests. We've got uh, Carlos Quiroz, who is a teacher, a history teacher actually, at SJC. Uh, Jalen Young, who is a Fort Form student at SJC, 4A to be exact. And Yasser Musa, no stranger to the media, but this time he's wearing his teacher cap Guys, good morning and welcome. It's nice to have you aboard. Thank you. Happy to be here. And such a fascinating subject. You know, I think uh, we should say, of course, that the uh, online portal and this specific project was launched earlier this month. But we're taking the time to find out a bit more about the work that went into it. And, of course, why this was something that the school chose to take on. Um, yes, yeah, sir, let's start with you. You are the head of the history department, and uh, not only this project, but we know there has been an overall objective to integrate African and Mayan history into the school system, specifically at SJC. Let's talk about uh, what it's like trying to maintain the lobbying effort to keep it relevant. Well, I'm glad you put it that way because I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, this Kaswar project does not happen in isolation. Uh, SJC in 2013 took a very bold step by implementing the teaching of African and Maya history at the first form level. And I am always uh, grateful for the leadership shown by our headmaster, Ms. Yolanda Gongra, for bringing together, because this is a team effort. Our uh, academic head, Ms. Melissa Andrade, also embraced it. So if it were not for the leadership, by embracing what we're doing, the process couldn't have started. Yes. And once they kind of opened the doors to the possibility of what could happen if we were to use history as a vehicle for mental and psychological liberation mm -hmm. in the classroom, rather than history as a quintessentially boring, dead, and archaic topic, then we were on the right track because there's nothing better than using something that you think is one thing and making it into something else. Yeah. I guess the art side of me saw that possibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we did first in 2013, before we even rolled it out, is we did a survey with the students. They are the clients. They are the customers of this project. Mm -hmm. And 90% and above of them said two things that I remember clearly. One. You, know, you need to know how to deal with the book. We can't have a, we can't have a big, thick book because nobody will read it, mm -hmm. we, which then connects to what they were saying about technology. We need to use technology to drive it. Mm -hmm. So the concepts of creativity and technology were married in this kind of space. And so then we put our objectives forward, which is we look, look at a four-year period of a high school cycle, mm -hmm. And we say to ourselves, what is it that we would want our young people, Belizeans, to know? Well, 
they certainly have to understand the root line of their origin. Mm -hmm. And first form is the best way to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Civilization, pre-civilization, we didn't just show up with the advent of Google. We were doing things <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years before that. And so by looking at Africa and Mesoamerican, specifically in our case Maya, mm -hmm. uh, indigenous civilization, we were able to start a kind of narrative uh, Im to trigger the imagination of the youth. C can I jump in there? Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we're to talk about the relevance of this right now, currently the conversation is looking at the history of the Garifuna. Correct. We can thank uh, Marvin Mora for laying out some of the background there in the very scandalous conversation that's a part of the news. <coughs> I bring that up because, you know, there are many people who say, is this true? Was this the truth about uh, the racial divides that took place during the colonial period? And a part of it stems from not necessarily having, whether it was taught in school, it doesn't seem to have stuck. Um, or some people never got exposed to our origins as whether you identify as Creole, Garifuna, Mestizo, Maya, or whichever ethnicity and beliefs, that it ultimately will come from these particular uh, races, these two, co these two areas. How do you, when you see this, this conversation taking place in the wider landscape, what does it mean for the necessity of this particular program and project? That's a great question. Um, racism mm -hmm. is a big issue in Belize. Mm -hmm. Classism, gender bias, homophobia, many forms of prejudice mm -hmm. exist. But we have done well in our first 36 years of independence of masking and covering it up as if it doesn't exist. If we were to then just look at history, even with the caste war exhibit, take away what the, the, the scenario you just presented, that was, that is, caste is race war. It was a race war. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't understand, we always think of race as pigmentation, skin color. Mm -hmm. We don't understand race as prejudice in terms of poverty, in terms of putting and keeping people down for generations, mm -hmm. hundreds of years, not 10, 20, 30 years. And so if you look at the situation with the Garifuna people, mm -hmm. that is an important narrative that we have infused in our curriculum because the Garifuna people, in a way, is the perfect African and Maya story. I don't mean it Maya in terms of their specific group, but in terms of the indigenous component of the mm -hmm. Americas. Mm -hmm. So we have the American indigenous person in the Garifuna, as well as the Garifuna having the African component. Mm -hmm. So when we teach about people, we don't just teach about their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. That is the danger in my view. We teach first about their humanity mm -hmm. and their contributions to humanity. That's something Andy Palacio sinked into my head very clearly, that when he went to the world stage to sing in his own language, an indigenous language, people in Indonesia and Germany and Mexico received him equally mm -hmm. because they could respect and understand his humanity. So when we hear on the media this kind of talk, that is not something we should be shocked about. If we were shocked at what those guys were saying, we would have been dishonest with ourselves because we have heard that kind of talk in our private conversations. Right. So let us not take this kind of moral superiority and say, oh, I can't believe that, and then throw these guys under the bus. What they have said is totally outrageous and unacceptable in any form. I'm not even going to get into that. Mm -hmm. But let us not be hypocrites and not recognize the deeper issues that are underneath. And that comes to your point. I, I'm sorry it took so long to no, reach. <laughs> that our education system is the place to deal with this. It's not the only place to deal with it, your home, your community, but it is a perfect, you can't be talking about we are an institution of social justice, which SJC prides itself in, mm -hmm. and not deal with these types of matters. And the history class, the history course, the history curriculum is the perfect space for debate, engagement, and it will be rough, and it has been rough for us. The kids have all kinds of preconceived notions, but whose responsibility it is to say, look, that's not the way you look at people. Mm -hmm. that this, the, we can't have a multicultural state without putting serious emphasis on 
the unraveling of the nastiness, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. prejudice that has gone before us. And addressing this war is also addressing racism in our country because this war was a very defining war for our country, whether we want to accept it or not. And it was also very much a war of the races here in Belize as well, mm -hmm. because the British created this idea in Belize City in which the, I don't want to use the term, but the Royal Creole, that identity was created during this war. And they, this idea that Belize City exists as this um, island in the Caribbean, rather as a part of the Yucatan, and it was Belize City versus the rest of the others, you know, what the British created this idea of the others. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, it was the British using this, uh, using their power and their authority mm -hmm. to take away the land from uh, the indigenous people of the north, mm -hmm. the Maya. So it was, and then in the urban areas like Orindrak and Corozal, they created this idea that, you know, you, the Mestizo people fleeing from the war up in the Yucatan, this is your safe haven where we will protect you from the wild, quote unquote, Indians that are here to destroy your livelihood, you know. So um, addressing this war is also addressing racism in Belize. This created not only our country, but this war created this racial divide that, like Yasser has said, we have been masking for so many years. We've 36 years um, since independence, and we're still on the Battle of St. George's Key story. Mm -hmm. We haven't moved away from that yet. We had once, we had once on, on the program as well, Brother David, along with his son, and they were talking about our African uh, uh, history and where we came from, our real names, and... In 2013, like, uh, like we've got here, you guys, uh, St. John's, rolled out that, you know what, we need to push history of African and Maya into uh, the school, which is first form, which is to start from first form. But uh, one of the things that I find very interesting is that, yes, at first form, you've got this uh, sort of developed mind. But as teachers, do you guys find it much more important to rule it uh, to probably, probably uh, primary school so as to know thyself? know thy history so we could eventually uh, tend to uh, 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 love each other in the way we're supposed to? Well, there has to be... I was a part in a previous life in 2004, a part of a bigger project mm -hmm. with Dr. Andofe, Joe Eo, and Angel Cal, of, then of the University of Belize, to roll out at the primary level the teaching of African and Maya history. Mm -hmm. And we did. They did most of the work. I was just like the... the dynamo in terms of trying to push it but they did a lot of the theoretical the the materials meaning the books we had all of that mm -hmm. done but doing that and rolling it out are two different things let us not forget that we have an educational system that is bogged down in a kind of mental misery a system that does not is not able to recognize its shortcomings as something to own. Mm -hmm. It is, why well, you know, we got we a Belize, man, we have to accept that. But why don't you own your problem yes. and then solve your problem? That is what this project and this process is about. I, yeah. I, and, I, and I think what you're touching there, that could be a whole other yes, conversation, that is uh, <laughs> not just the <laughs> archaic <laughs> system, but also even if you implement a curriculum, Will the teachers be equipped to inform the students and engage the students? And with that said, I want to bring in our student that is here. And of yes. course, you're a fourth form student. Actually, you're about to graduate. So you're about to, to leave the system. But I want to hear from you, Jalen, about uh, why you're a part of the History Club mm -hmm. and uh, how this information has impacted you. Well... Four years ago, I didn't have a choice, whether or not, as a part of the I love the curriculum. honesty. Yes. But after a second form, being so involved that I, like I was, I developed that liking to the history course, 
which made me, in third form, decide to choose it because I wanted to learn more. I developed a deeper passion to learn about my history, the history of other races. Mm -hmm. And listening to my teachers talk about the concept of racism, history for me, as, a, as most of my other classmates, gave us a deeper, um, we, we develop a deeper understanding of what our ancestors went through. So we may, maybe not as, mo as most people would say, we understand them and we love them as we should, but at least we respected their struggle. And that for me is what I like most about history. So now I'm gonna test your teachers, right? And the test of the teachers is how much you have learned as well. So tell me what has been a part of your education process in history that has really stood out to you that you would have never been exposed to or you feel that you would have never been exposed to up to this point in your life. The African and Maya history aspect, mostly African because mm -hmm. we usually learn that people originate from Africa, but you don't really learn much about Africa in the sense of what they actually had back then. Mm. It was shocking to me to find out that Africa had one of the first universities in Timbuktu long before the Europeans even developed education. And that was very shocking. Fantastic. Now this must be a great moment for of you course. to hear Proud the moment. students relay the information in terms of how they connect with it. And I'm sure they all find different areas that they connect with. Let's bring it to the Cast War project now specifically. And this is looking at something that happened in the 1800s. Uh, we're talking about Maya civilization, we're talking about racial war, and we're talking about how it impacts our life today. Now, you decide to tackle the historical elements, but you're also using technology and you're using art. You're using infographics as well. Let's talk about formulating this project and how you decided that this was the best way forward to get it out, not just to your students, but to the wider public. Well, I could talk about the concept yeah. and then Mr. Kiros, who is the man of the hour, so to speak, in terms of the <laughs> infographic, something yeah. that I admire how he does it, because it's not an easy thing. It's not yeah. just art. Yeah. It's, it's merging information with art. Yeah. But we, because we have to deal with so much information and uh, stories, right? Mm -hmm. We recognize that when you look through the materials, whether it's on the web, in books, whatever, that there is something disturbing about a war that lasted 54 years, over 250,000 people dying, mm -hmm. and yet it doesn't play a central role in the consciousness mm -hmm. of our society. That to us it seems, and that's where we always come from, mm -hmm. a conspiracy. There's some conspiracy here. Mm -hmm. Yes, SJC from the 70s in Belizean studies have been publishing as part of their uh, materials in their history classes about the caste war and the people to thank for that are the people like Richard Bueller, Lita Krohn, mm -hmm. Herman Bird, Furla Salam mm -hmm. up recently. I mean there is a, a record there. But then we are now in the digital space. Mm -hmm. We have been digital natives for over 20 years. I, rem I was telling uh, Carlos that 20 years ago we used to hear about bridging the digital divide. Well, either you fell into the abyss or you're, you have crossed it. Yeah. Now we are here. Mm -hmm. And how do we now take all that information that is now hidden mm -hmm. and bring it into the popular space? Yeah. And this classroom is a popular space. Mm -hmm. And the web is perhaps the most popular space. So we decided to then focus on the web portal. So if you go there, all teachers can go there, all principals, all students, and click on the Belize History SJC site and go to the yeah. Cast War and see our curriculum, our lesson plans, our videos of, because this thing has, to, has a community component mm -hmm. as well, which I would love to talk about, and the infographic yeah. component, which mm -hmm. maybe Carlos Well, I know this is crazy, but <laughs> as a history teacher, I'll go on the record and say, when I took history in high school, I never read a history book. I <laughs> would only look at it and it would immediately turn me off. Um, in high school, I fell in love with history, uh, mainly because of my history teacher. She was a very good, she was skilled at um, talking. So 
I fell in love with. You have to give that a, teacher props. Who yeah. is that? Uh, Miss Marissa Pereira. Okay, okay. good. In Orange Rock. So um, I never, I never in high school, I never uh, picked up a book and read, as you say, uh, cover to cover and um, extensively. I wasn't a reader. It wasn't until I went to university that I <clears throat> developed a love for reading. So um, what I realized in going now into the classroom at SJC as a teacher is that I wasn't the only person. You know, there's a lot of me out there and uh, <laughs> history, particularly Belizean history, um, as it stands right now, is very boring mm -hmm. for teenagers. So I started to talk to Yasser and, you know, realizing that something needed to be done and something needs to be done with Belizean history in terms of capturing the attention of the young people because mm -hmm. that is where it is most important. Now, when they get older, like me, um, then you have that discipline to sit down and read a history book from cover to cover. But at that age, um, I think JLN can tell you there's no interest in sitting down <laughs> and reading these. <laughs> oh, we these make that face on time. <laughs> <laughs> sitting down and reading these high academic yeah. uh, publications from cover to cover. So mm -hmm. we need to face the reality. Yeah. And that is where this idea of making Belizean history more of a visual experience because simply at high, I know as teachers we get uh, angry and say, ah, they're picking not to read anymore, they're not like read. <laughs> and like, from time we didn't like reading at that age, you mm -hmm. know. It's very few, some of us that can sit down and read a book from cover to cover yeah. without images. But that doesn't mean that because you don't have that interest in reading a book from cover to cover that you shouldn't know your history. Everyone is entitled to know their history. So if you're an audio learner, you're a visual learner, you still have that right, I believe, to know your history. And this is our way of reaching out and giving out each child that right to know their history yeah. and capturing their attention from a very young age so that when they get older and they do come across that big, boring book on a shelf, mm -hmm. they say, why? I remember sir say, I remember one sir cover this topic in a class. Make I pick up this book and yeah. see what they say. And then they now, at an old age, have that discipline to yeah. sit down and read that book. Yeah. You know, and every... Like, uh, going back to what I was saying, we think that every child across this nation, we need to figure out ways how to reach out to them. We've failed them. We've not given them that proper education as it relates to their history. And images um, have such a lasting mm -hmm. impression. You know, we can recall an image more than we can recall perhaps verbatim what you said in class. Yeah. So moving to the infographics is obviously one way to capture the attention, but also hopefully make something stick in all that you have been doing. How difficult is the process of taking the entire history <laughs> of the caste war and putting together infographics that would be most impactful? Well, um, I think more than anything, what I've observed and what we've all observed in the classroom is that now we lack, and it's unfortunate because it, this day and age of technology, we lack a sense of space, mm -hmm. an understanding of space, visualizing space. And I think the, one of the first steps we wanted to make in terms of visualizing history is putting these events in a space. Because history is about time and space. Mm -hmm. Now time is a way more complicated concept to try mm -hmm. and grasp. But at a young age, we need to start, as it relates to history, giving these students a sense of space, context, where these events happened. Yeah. Um, these are the people affected in this area, you know? And it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. We, in Belize City, have this sense that we are an island floating in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And we ignore the Yucatan. And this is what this casuar and our history program is all about. Mm -hmm. It's not about ignoring the Caribbean, but telling students, you know, look, you guys are as much a part of Central America and the Yucatan as you are a part of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I know some people are going to be angry at me for saying this, but I'm going to go on the record and say, I think that is where CXE has failed 
our Belizean history. Mm. Because CXC creates this idea that Belize is this island floating in the Caribbean and we ignore our neighbors to the west, our neighbors to the north, and our neighbors to the south. Mm -hmm. And for you, uh, Stephen, with what have been placed together about this caste war and history in a whole and how it has been rolled out at SJC, what are your friends saying? What are the, your fellow, stu uh, your fellow uh, classmates saying in terms of uh, the captivation? Are they as interested as you are? Well, I can't speak for my friends, most of them, because mm -hmm. they'll tell you the reason why they chose history because they are horrible artists. <laughs> but, <laughs> we had a choice. <laughs> but for me, I can speak for myself, and the caste war was intriguing because you learn about the Vietnam Vietnamese war, World War II, and all the way up to first form, I never heard of caste war, and when I heard of it, and what these people went through, our own Belizeans know today, what they went through was horrible, and it made me even more interested to find out about it, to learn more about it, even more than what we learned about World War II and the Vietnam Vietnamese War. Mm -hmm. So it's captivating simply because these people are around us every day, and we tend to not look at them, and we don't even know what they went through, their ancestors. So if I can learn what they went through, maybe I can respect them more and appreciate them more. Here are some of the interesting things that I found. First of all, I think one of the things that stand out for me from the images is looking at the historical sites that still exist. Right. And that's, I, I think, something that will stay with me. So I'll drive past uh, the fort in Corazon, and, and I know you have the images in some of the uh, infographics. Uh, if, I, if I drive past these now, and I've watched just one infographic, I now know the historical value behind mm -hmm. it. So let's talk about these sites that still exist in Belize and how it ties into the caste war, so we can still teach people a bit even during this segment. Well, the best way to look at it is this way, that the Yucatan Peninsula is a hurricane zone, both atmospherically and socially, that a lot of hurricanes have happened in this space. Upheaval, killing, murder, all kinds of crazy things have happened. But then there is a silence, and we look at a site, and then we have to use our imagination to go back and connect to our ancestry. What he said just now was a powerful statement mm -hmm. that you need to understand the other. So I have to be a Garifuna, even with how I look. And you have to be a Maya, even with how you look, mm -hmm. if we are to agree that we are Belizean. Mm -hmm. Think about that. There is no way we can continue to perpetuate the lie that being Belizean is one thing. It is a multi-dimensional, multi-spatial concept that we have arrived at an openness, that we are free people. And to be free means you cannot be better than the other. That's called Trumpism and all kinds of other things that I can make up. I just use that word because we know how that looks. Yeah. That has an ideology. That ideology is a post-truth ideology that I can just make up anything to mask. That's how masking works. The reason I have said earlier that we've masked our racism is that there are powerful forces out there that mask things and confuse us and say, this is now the truth. And then the hidden fire that's burning in us as people is underneath saying, but you're lying. So places like Yo Creek and San Lazaro and Orange Walk Town and Merida and Valladolid and Carrillo Puerto, inside this hurricane space that I talk about, have deep connections to the DNA of who we are. So for example, in the video earlier, we saw Mr. Pedro Carrillo of San Lazaro village in the Orange Walk district crying. Mm -hmm. You know why he was crying? He was, I was the one videoing him and he was speaking in Maya and he started to cry. Carlos was right there. He was recalling what his grandfather went through during that caste war. And there are thousands of stories like his. We cannot negate a people's story because we want to just create a fiction about who we are. That is unacceptable. And so when you hear Mr. Carrillo crying and so, 
that shows you the deepness of how history runs. And so if you listen to music and you see people dance and you see that cultural explanation or that cultural identity coming out, mm -hmm. our identity, as I said, is multi-layered. And we can't forget the space. You know, it's funny because when I think of today's society and how people look outside, and, and, and I appreciate when you talk about what learning about uh, the Vietnamese war and wars outside of this region, People look to Syria with so much empathy. People look to uh, areas of conflict and where people are fleeing in mass numbers and fighting for their life and survival. And we have that story here. Right. That's our caste war. Just and that's here. where people, many of us, have our origins in this country. We're Belizeans, but our ancestral roots go back to whether my ancestors fleed from a particular area in Yucatan down to Orange Walk. And that's where it all started for me. But we don't know how to make these connections because we don't have the history of the caste war. And I love that you went into the different communities and spoke to people. Tell us about that process. So you found Mr. Carrillo, you said. Yes, Mr. Pedro. Carrillo. Well, I thank his son and yeah. I thank uh, Miss Vianney Novello, who's another mm -hmm. history colleague of ours. She's originally from, I think she's still from, or originally from. She, mm -hmm. uh, she's from. San Lazaro. Her yeah. grandfather was on, uh, on the interview as well. Mm -hmm. And there's an important small story that's significant about this project. Mm -hmm. Tell us. She spoke to the elderly women mostly of the Catholic Church, a small church in San Lazaro. Mm -hmm. And they have a cross that was brought across, no pun intended, during the caste war, and a statue of a Virgin Mary mm -hmm. that they still have in their church. And they lent it to us for our exhibit. To me, I, was, I couldn't get over how powerful a statement of trust mm -hmm. that is. And I kept pondering why. And when I spoke to um, Hugo, the son of Mr. Carrillo, he said that because you all are telling our story, mm -hmm. I can trust you all. Mm -hmm. And that is an important idea, that people feel they can give up such a cherished item that is part of their community and part of their belief system to some school in Belize City that's doing something, I mean, they don't know the details of what we're doing, mm -hmm. and have that trust in us, that to me is a community connection that the education system must make. Mm -hmm. Because it is a community that sends its children to our care. Mm -hmm. So we have to do what they want. Mm -hmm. And what they really want is for us to tell the truth about the story of our people. That is, the, to me, the bottom line about this. And history shouldn't be looked at just as narrative. It should be society, it should be art, it should be culture, it should be politics, economy. It's all mixed up. It should be a dynamic force because it can't just be one thing, right? For far, for far too long, the story has only been, you know, the war broke out. Maya These people, to this they run refugees, the border. They're immigrants, yeah. like how Trump looks at Yeah, people. thank God they bring um, pork to build tacos and can't <laughs> Yeah, that has been the story for so far, yeah. for far too long. We want to highlight to people that, you know, the story is bigger than this. There is more to this story than just pork to build tacos and people running away. Tell us about Marcus Cano. That's obviously the person you chose to, to be the icon of this project. Tell us why. Well, Marcos Canol was one of the leaders, uh, Ikaiche leaders, that led uh, various attacks on some of the British strongholds in the north, mm -hmm. particularly um, Orinjoak and Corozal. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, Marcos Canol has been kept out of our history, mm -hmm. unfortunately, because he has been labeled as a rebel, a bandito, mm -hmm. as yesterday. Um, I was talking to one of my third farm classes and they made a comparison with Marcos Canul and what the Americans did with Augusto Sandino, mm -hmm. labeling him as a bandito as the same they did with Fidel Castro. The British did the same thing with Marcos Canul, labeled him as this wild man mm -hmm. uh, terrorizing our poor mestizo brothers and sisters, terrorizing our poor British camps up in northern Belize. And unfortunately, that image was what was uh, hammered into our national identity. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, Canol now is viewed as a nuisance to our national development, our national identity, rather as a hero. And this is a conscious effort to 
try and uh, highlight the objectives of these, um, this movement that was led by Kano to protect their land from the invading British. And okay. Who was invading who? That's yeah. the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and that was, that's a key thing. I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting, the image that you've gotten to. He, he has a machete in his hand mm -hmm. uh, as, as, a, as a leader of Fight. a war. Yes, and a fighter uh, yeah. Yeah. for land rights, human rights. And thank you, because that was really what I wanted to get at still. Um, we're still having issues with indigenous communities fi fighting for land rights. Mm -hmm. This time now, it doesn't take place with the machete. It takes place in, in the court system. Yeah. But it's fascinating when you think about And this isn't just unique to Belize. You know, this is uh, the, in, the rights of the indigenous people have become more of a global priority. We hear more about First Nation people, whether you're talking about aboriginals or uh, native Indians or the Mayans in this area, that it has become perhaps clearer to some people, not all, that there were people who were in these parts of the, this part of the world be long before the Europeans came, long before the Spaniards came. And what are the rights owed to them? Because after their spaces were invaded. So how do you fit this all into the context? Because I appreciate, and this is one of the things I guess with history that is difficult, because you can continuously look back, but we can still see so much of what happened then in today's society, but with well, a different context. Let me, let me put it to you this way. I always start, because land rights mm -hmm. and land issues is a fundamental concept we need to teach our young people. Mm -hmm. For them first to love their land and want to own their land mm -hmm. and be invested in their land, whether by agriculture or development, whatever. Mm -hmm. But in 1971, Nigel Bolland and Asa Juman wrote a book, Land in Belize. And in that book, if you look there, it has a stunning statistic that over 95% of the land was owned by 3% of the people. So I tell my students, so what does that mean? It means that 5% of the land was owned by, was owned, 97% of the people only own 5%. 5%. You always have to look at the radical next side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that has changed, yes, to a great extent. But look what happened, for example, how they have people in the north got access to their land through a land reform for their, their sugar cane, as an example, land, right? And look how fast now that is being unraveled with this ASR situation. And then you look at the South. Mm -hmm. For how long the indigenous Maya have been fighting for their land communal rights. And everybody is fighting for their right land. And so it, things are so confused. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the question I have is, is land tenure and ownership, are we going to define it as something, as part of our Belizean identity? Or... Is it just going to be a briefcase of money? But it goes even deeper than that. Because if we talk about, and let's look at the land rights case, you know, landmark case. And those things have Nothing gone all the way up to the highest more court. more hurtful to the Mayan yes. communities in the South than to sit in the courtroom and have testimony about whether or not the Mayans in the South today were the original Mayas in the South uh, when Belize became Belize. That was, and, and that was and done by experts. And the dissecting of the history almost to say, and yes, it was your ancestors, but it wasn't you yes, because you yeah. really came from another space. And that, that is, yeah, and that is also my discontent with how the casuar is being treated as well. As I keep telling you, sir, I can't accept that the North was completely deserted by Maya people, <laughs> North Western Belize. The way the narrative is that when the war broke out, that's when they ran across the river. You can't tell me that there wasn't one single community, Maya community, mm -hmm. in northwestern Belize when the British started to invade northwestern Belize. Yeah. Let me ask you but something. But that testimony, I would want to go on the record, because that testimony was done by experts, mm -hmm. archaeologists mm -hmm. and so, yeah. and big time lawyers yeah. created that scenario. Yeah. That, to me, was one of the most incredible mm -hmm acts of intellectual dishonesty that I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. And, and, yeah. and I, I bring it up because I know when the, uh, the representatives came to talk about it, th those who were presenting the Mayan communities, mm -hmm. they were genuinely hurt at how uh, it was being portrayed almost that they were immigrants yes. in the land that they were fighting for. Well, the courts rule as they did, which proves to the validity of, right. of those arguments. But I, I want to bring it back to something else, because going back to the larger issue of what you call the many different divides that we have in this country, 
Um, how do you put forward the information about the caste war without having it viewed as important information for the Mestizo and Maya communities or important information for people from the North? The same way I put forward the Garifuna story. Mm -hmm. If we are going to say that a people were almost, there was almost a genocide committed on a people that are still here, mm -hmm. and we are not going to allow our Mestizo and Maya and whoever ethnicity to learn that and understand the humanity of it. Mm -hmm. Because at the core, the concept of a self-determined Belizean person mm -hmm. is this idea of we are free. But then you have to now define what it means to be free. Yeah. It can't be that you have all these prejudices that continue to exist and we're not fighting to unravel it and make a just, a more just society. Mm -hmm. So my argument is always this. You have to learn everybody's history in order to learn your history. Mm -hmm. And you, unless you live in Siberia, where there's only one group of people and nobody, you're disconnected. This is a global space we're in. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you learn about the others, you then come to the modern story of Belize, mm -hmm. which is the fight for independence. How you can't reach that story unless you're being honest with the young people. There's a lot more that we want to talk about. <laughs> and, and I gotta say, we lucked out because we actually have a bit more time that we can invest in this. So what I'm gonna do at this time is go ahead and take a very quick break. And when we come back, uh, we'll look into a bit more of the details that uh, you have been able to put, to put together in this project, right? So that's coming up after the break. For over 20 years, Great Belize Television, Channel 5, has been the leader in award-winning local programming. We have also produced some of the best video commercials, documentaries, and live events for clients countrywide. And we continue to offer high-quality production services to maximize your advertising needs for your business or organization. From concept to completion, let us help you achieve your marketing goal by producing your commercial, documentary, graphic animation, live event, or even designing your website. Using state-of-the-art equipment and experienced personnel, we can make your ideas come alive. For more information, come see us on Coney Drive or give us a call at 223-0146 or 223-7781 or email us at gbtv at dtl.net. Great Belize Productions, making great television in Belize. And welcome back. Very, very interesting conversation with uh, folks from the, from St. John's College, uh, the Cast War Project. The conversation continues about the online Cast War Project. A very interesting, like we mentioned, Yasser Musa, uh, Stephen Yearwood, or Yearwood actually. No, and no, no, no. Jaylen, we have Jalen. Jalen, 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 and... Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm actually mixing up the hammer, the hammer here. Carlos <laughs> uh, Quiroz, guys. Very interesting... Um, uh, very interesting topic. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that we don't do uh, like across the country is actually getting to know who we are. And this segment is actually showcasing that where we came from and how we should uh, continue to appreciate. And so we'd, uh, we continue. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we've also seen where through this project, this project is one example, as you pointed out, in the, um, the school's objective in integrating African and Mayan history. But you've also done some very innovative projects in getting the young people involved in reenactments and looking beyond uh, centuries ago and looking to just decades ago as well. So talk to us, Jalen. We understand that you were a part of uh, a very important reenactment and you played Evan X Hyde. Wow. Tell us about that. That was my most memorable moment in my high school career. Wow. I, <laughs> I, I evoked passion I probably less than he did but I tried my best <laughs> and it was very rewarding because from playing playing the part of the next side it gave me more um, patriotism respect for my country and I felt like a real life revolutionary and to see the people garner around me and they showed their support and cheered me on I was very happy and appreciative of that and of the moment because I was selected and 
I rose to the occasion and proved myself like Evan X I did in his moment. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the discovery of the moment itself as to who these people represented. There was Evan X, there was for that, for yeah, that, for that one. reenactment, yeah. Jesus Ken of uh -huh. the King Farmers Association. Antonio Soberani. So tell us what you learned about that because it's it's not something that we can all we, we have emphasized within our Belizean history. Well, if I can recall correctly, correctly that was two years ago. And mm -hmm. um, at the exact moment, we were going through black history mm -hmm. and how they were the black history movement in America, the Black Panthers. And it was shocking to me that we had one rep at Belize, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't really know about that. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. that was when I was made aware that we had our own movements in Belize and mm -hmm. people like Ava and Exide, they were key key leaders in our mo movements and our revolutionary mm -hmm. as black people. Mm -hmm. But how uh, important is, is it? And uh, before I continue with the question, I've got to apologize. I keep on calling you another name when you're Jalen <laughs> Young. So I want to apologize for that. But how important was that for you, knowing that you are actually playing a role of what history is like in Belize? And would you say that that is what captivated you to really love history at SJC? It, I can say that because you, you gain a sense of pride from that, and that pride is what builds your passion. And once you have a pride and a passion for something, you tend to go up more and put more effort into it. Mm -hmm. How was it like for you putting yourself into character? I mean, these guys are powerful people, and we know that movement was actually powerful as well, especially uh, when it comes to the black movement or the black, uh, the, um, the black Panthers. What was that like for you putting yourself into character? Did you study a segment? Did you watch the individual? Did you watch a tape? Bef before that, I did not know who Evan Excite was. And to be honest, I met him for the first time when we were opening the exhibit for the Casuar. But to be honest, it was very humbling. And I had a piece of paper that had the lines, and I read this over and over. But when you're reading it to yourself, you don't have it much. You don't have the same emotion as you would in front of a crowd. So I practiced it a lot. But when I got out there, it just came out. Mm -hmm. I didn't even practice the how I'd say it with power and emphasis. I just went out there and did how I know, did it how I think I should do it and mm -hmm. try to evoke as much emotion out of myself as possible. You know, Jalen, you're living in a, in a generation perhaps that hasn't been as exposed to some of the struggles that this very <laughs> country yeah. has gone through, you know. Um, people talk about the peaceful way we were able to attain our independence. Uh, where countries around us had literally fought uh, and, and lost blood over being able to, to gain the rights of their own country. Um, when you get the historical context that there was struggle, there were people and leaders who fought to shape the direction of the country, what does it mean for you? I think it should just make us appreciate what we have even more because, as you said, a lot of people lost their lives for their country and they did it willingly and they would continue to do it if they had to do it again. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have to go through the same struggle, so therefore we should appreciate our independence more and try our best to build our nation and pay homage to those who didn't have the same easy road as us. Could I say something sure. about Jalen, which when he was talking, it really struck me how deep this moment was for him personally. But there was another moment that he, I want to remind him of, and the Belize. When Fidel Castro died last year, uh, Mr. Kiros, who was the teacher of Jalen, they had a conversation, and Jalen wrote a letter to the people of Cuba expressing condolence of losing their great leader and outlined, I'm sure he got help from his teacher, but mm. outlined what Cuba meant to Belize's independence and how George Price relied on the good will mm -hmm. of the Cuban people mm -hmm. during our struggle mm -hmm. to get votes at the United Nations. That's an important story. Yeah. The important story of the history, but more importantly, that in 2017, a youth man, youth can write something 
so amazing that just and then we we made it into a ceremony because I think that's the part teachers should play. We printed it, all the members of the history club signed it, like a big declaration, we framed it, mm -hmm. we took it to the Cuban embassy, we had a formal invitation, presented it, and the Cuban ambassador and the assistant were overwhelmed. The sketch too. Yeah. Oh, and another student in art drew Fidel Castro, a young revolutionary fighter, so we presented the art and the letter, and they said that they would send it formally to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. and it would be displayed in uh, a memorial that they have in Cuba. To me, that kind of act, mm -hmm. that kind of action sinks deep into the consciousness because of Because it you. goes beyond just memorizing mm -hmm. history. Yes. And that's really where we've always been when it comes to talking about our own history or any history. It's just um, being able to recite what I read in a book correct. many years ago, if I've you have a good enough I've memory. I've never written a test, a quiz, or an assignment that I asked them to memorize a date. Mm -hmm. Never. That's one of our policies, by the way. We're not into memorization. First yeah. of all, I, I, I extend congratulations to, to, to Jalen for uh, what he has done. But I think the reason why, he's did, uh, why he did it is because he actually understands Correct. how these people became uh, icons in their, in their country when it comes to iconic leaders because they fought for what they believed in. And because he understands is the reason why he could actually pen on paper to write to that country to tell them, you know what, you guys have lost a great leader. Uh, uh, another thing that I want to shed light on, and it, and it stems from the fact that they actually reenacted uh, the, the black movement. One of the reenactments I could always reflect on for our country, which is history, is the uh, Yurume reenactment. Right. And so a lot of people you know, are captivated to it because they continue to reenact. SJC is actually putting uh, students in, in, in that area whereby they get the ability to understand via reenactment. Are yes. we continuing this at SJC? That's a great question, and I'd like to put it in this bigger uh, frame. A student mm -hmm. provoked us a couple of years ago to start a history club. Not us, a student. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Monings, Rupert, Rupert Monings, Monings, I have to say his name because he's still very active, he's third former right now. We started the history club, and today I can say we have over 70 members of a history club. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, every Wednesday, that every couple of times a month, at 3.15 on the morning, we have a guest presenter, mm -hmm. whether it's a bioarchaeologist, an archaeologist, a former uh, prime minister. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Godfrey Smith came to talk about his book on Michael Manley. Mm -hmm. Christ, uh, Christina mm -hmm. Cook came to talk about land rights at the wow. South. But we tell them only 15 minutes because these guys, they're TED people. They don't have more than 15 <laughs> minutes. Mm -hmm. Bring the lecture in 15 <laughs> because then they want to ask questions and it's like a, like a scrum of mm -hmm. journalists. Yeah. What is this? And they just hammer the presenters. And when you're done, the presenters are like, Wow, <laughs> look how many questions. We have to stop it mm -hmm. because it's overwhelming for them. That's one aspect. The other aspect, we go on trips, whether it's to a site, whether it's to a place of memory. Mm -hmm. And then finally, your point. Mm -hmm. This concept of reenactment, this concept of being in history. And I know you heard him mm -hmm. when he said he was practicing the lines, like what you were saying. Now you could read it, read it. But when you get out there and the screaming fellow students are going off and then you shout black power and they all shout it back. You're like, wow, this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. I can feel it in a, a visceral mm -hmm. way. Connect all of that then to our web portal where all our, we give them, our thing is to take it upside down. These kids, they get study guides. They get all the information up front. Mm -hmm. The questions that we're asking them on tests are not about information. It's about analysis, mm -hmm. about how to think about these things. Interpretation. In the, yes. Yeah. So, they have no problem in, oh, our history test today, they're not stressed at all. Mm -hmm. Because they can handle. I mean, of course, there are still some that are, you know. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a crucial skill that some picture. would argue we yeah. lack within society today. The, the capacity to analyze situations yes, have to give them and them formulate opinions. Correct. And that, that also emphasizes that infographics can work as well. If these yeah. uh, students from a very young age can develop these complex questions just based off of looking at these images, these infographics, right. yeah. then it means, you know, it works. It's capturing their attention as to giving them five pages to summarize and then they walk away. Um, 
This sounds like a great history art project in the making where your students now create infographics about other historical moments in Belize. Well, my last yeah. test, the students created the test. They wrote yeah. all the questions wow. and they have all the answers. Ooh. And they did very well. Mm -hmm. But you see, in the orthodoxy, they are saying, are you the Gideon answer? No, I'm not. We've had lengthy discussions about this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not about trying to test them mm -hmm. or creating obstacles. Mm -hmm. It's trying to get them to be free up to start. Take a time now, reflect on what we've been doing, and feel free to write it how you want to write it now. Mm -hmm. To me, that is a hurdle too, but it's a pedagogical hurdle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, as you pointed out, there's a lot of effort uh, and a lot of different projects that have been taking place within the history department at SJC. And, and could I say something on behalf of yeah. our school? Yeah. Um, and our headmaster has never put any obstacle in front of us. Mm -hmm. That, for me, is a huge uh, mm -hmm. plus. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to say that the Belize History SJC.com is an open yeah. space and that we are prepared to assist any school in having them roll this out. Yeah. It's, not, it's not hard. What is hard is for them to then build a team within their school system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because maybe somewhere else they can do it even better than yeah. us. Mm -hmm. They might have access to more resources than us. What I, what I think would be very important, especially uh, to continue to roll out history, uh, Belizean history or history and in a whole, yes. so people can understand who they really are would be a project to uh, have your third or fourth form students to actually adapt a primary school, whereby mm. they make a project out of that primary That's school, a great idea. Uh, historical wise, so as to uh, uh, you put, them, put them into what it was like. Yeah. Remember, what we teach them today will eventually be who, uh, um, be who they will become uh, in, the, in the future. Yes. So I think, because, and, and I get this from the fact that, especially after Brother David and after listening to you guys as to that's not your real name, your real name is actually, you know, mm, correct. and when I, when I hear that and when I, when I hear the passion that you guys have for it, the importance of what history is for this country and for who we are and how we could eventually start to appreciate and love each other and eliminate the fact that we could actually look at somebody, uh, you, you, yeah, yeah, and you, you, you. Correct. I think... Uh, uh, a project, a history project with primary school to bring them up would be very important yes. on the aspect of SJC or this country and a whole. Well, and Fantastic. Yeah. And, and there you go. You've, you've left with your challenge for yes, today. Yes, yes. <laughs> big one, big one. <laughs> Thanks for that. That's awesome. No, but it is. Yeah. And, and I think uh, sharing information and not only that, knowing, developing the, the capacity to pass it on. So it's right. not just something that's exclusive to them. You pointed out the website and I did want to get to the point that you have posted the curriculum, sure. lesson plans. Everything is online, accessible to anyone who wants to go on the site, BelizeHistorySJC.com. Uh, so if you're a school in Toledo and you want to utilize this, you can. Um, or if you just want to be somebody who's going to brush up on your own history for yourself, you can be able to do it. And I'm prepared also one more thing. I know time is an issue. Yeah. We presented uh, at that Kaswar show a flash drive to our own school yeah. with 1,000 157 books, electronic books that we put it on the flash drive. So I am prepared if they are willing, the school, I could give each school a library. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if you add it up on Amazon, you're talking $30,000 worth of books on a flash drive. And I'm prepared to give them a library, any school that wants it, that is seeing the relevance. Because then they can adjust it how they want. Mm -hmm. But I think now with the internet, we can all create mm -hmm. a multi-dimensional space of discussion mm -hmm. among many history teachers. And because you just made an amazing point just mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. if we bring this up to other people all over the country, they might have twenty times better ideas mm -hmm. and get the ball rolling. To me, that's how it rolls. Right? Yeah. It has to be a viral yeah. experience, but positive viral. Yeah. Fantastic effort, and and we are glad that we had the chance to get you guys in to speak about this more. It isn't something I, I know that happens very easily. Uh, you've been advocating for it, but also putting together all the information, ensuring that your students are on board. Um, so we know there's a lot of work that went into it, and we thank you for coming in and sharing all this information. Anything okay. else you guys would like to close with? Let's start with our new graduate, or soon to be soon new to be. graduate. Yeah. What would you like to tell Belizeans about learning and understanding your history? Well, I'd like to tell our Belizean that history is important because if you know your past, then you can prepare for a better future. So you, you should make a conservative effort to know where you came from 
so you can be all that you can be, reach your full potential as a people in love and harmony. Mm. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, and I can always speak based on my experience, but I like to um, end on a note that we need to get rid of this idea that arts doesn't belong in a history class. One of the first things humans did to physically document their story was to paint on rocks and paint in caves. Mm -hmm. You know, Diego Rivera chronicles Mexican and the history of the Americas in paintings. Mm -hmm. And um, I, and I think we can all agree here that images, paintings, artworks have a very important place in mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. and capturing imaginations and provoking discussion. Fantastic. Christiana Manpour, one of my favorite journalists, gave a commencement address last week where she says that the concept of society, because of global forces, can be erased in a year. And we are seeing mm -hmm. how an empire, the American empire, are rattling right now because there is a threat on the first draft of history, which is journalism. Mm -hmm. And she said that it was in World War II, during the Holocaust, that an investigative journalist uncovered the horror of Hitler, and it was a woman journalist. Mm -hmm. And she listed off many powerful examples of female journalists. Mm -hmm. The same way we approach racism, in terms of our material, there is, and I'm going on record with this, a horrible record of leaving women out. And that Although we are an all-boys school, we have to take responsibility, both intellectually and psychologically, for that fact. Mm -hmm. So the road ahead is long and it's beautiful mm -hmm. because we know what our problem is and we own that problem. That women are left out, that the Maya of the North and the people of the North were left out. We own that. So then we solve that. And that, to me, is the lesson of all this. And the side effect and the spillover is that our children will be more able to see the world with a bigger lens open up the prism mm -hmm. so that they feel wow i'm a part of this this mm -hmm. tolerant space okay thank you so much for this riveting conversation this morning we appreciate it we know we kept you guys a little bit longer than you were supposed to <laughs> thank you for uh, the extra time <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time and cook Great job on Thank this you. project, and I'm sure we'll see more as time goes by. Thank you again. Thanks. We're going to go ahead. Enjoy your graduation. And congratulations, congratulations again. Right? Yeah. Best of luck with the future. We're going to go ahead now and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be hearing uh, from Premium Hair, the distributors of Premium Hair, about their launch in Belize. So stay tuned.